Rising up above the sea is a land of wonder, is a land of mystery. Mystery Island, who ah, Mystery Island, who? So much to discover, so much for us to see. God's truth never failing, all the way through history. Mystery Island, who ah, Mystery Island, who? There's a place you gotta see, a land of discovery. It's Mystery Island, Mystery Island. Searching for the ancient truth, hand it down to me and you. Mystery Island, come on! Won't you come along with me? On a search to the island, for the clues hidden all around. Mystery Island, Mystery Island, Mystery Island. 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 M
Uh, stop talking to each other and listen to me. We're going to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. If anybody noticed that our sanctuary and our church has been transformed, um, if you haven't, it's probably because you had your eyes closed. All right. Um, we are uh, uh, getting ready for Vacation Bible School, and we're excited that it starts tonight, and uh, we've uh, uh, wanted you to feel that and experience that today. They've moved me uh, behind the scenes here, um, so I, I don't know what I'm going to do today as far as wandering, so you'll just have to kind of, you know, uh, see me peek out from behind the flowers and whatnot. So we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're glad that folks are joining us online and uh, those that are other places uh, listening to us this morning. We're glad you've come to worship with us. Uh, we hope that you will encourage others to come back tonight. Uh, Josh will speak a little bit more about all the details about Bible school um, uh, as he gets up. But we want to encourage you to come back. We have classes for everybody, as he'll tell you a little later on. So. All right, um, we're going to go ahead and begin our worship this morning with a song. So, uh, Ron, and uh, come on. I'll get out of the way. Let's all stand and sing together. Number 107 in the hymnal. Lord, I lift your name on high. Welcome. Uh, VBS is tonight, starting tonight, running through Thursday from 6 to 830. And we do have a class for every age group, that is babies all the way through adults. And um, we will have dinner each night. If you haven't registered already, that's okay. You can show up and we'll have a registration station here for you if you want to register then. I would encourage you, though, to go ahead and register online on our website at midwaybaptistnc.org if you can. And just a couple of announcements. Regarding VBS, if you are a worker or volunteer, please see Ms. Carolyn and Keg Ferguson in the Old Sanctuary directly after service. They will be handing you your t-shirt and your name badge. And if you are a teacher, your name badge will have your little rotation on the back, so I hope that's helpful. Um, also, we are having a, what's the word I'm looking for, benefit sale towards uh, the end of August and so be on the lookout for that information uh, probably next week in the bulletin online and uh, social media Kingston okay all right and um, there was one more and I forgot my paper I'm sorry I must be getting old <laughs> somebody help me out was that it okay well oh children's church how could I forget goodness Sorry about that. Forgive me. Children's Church, we are starting back with Children's Church, and we do have a wonderful curriculum, and we had a good group last week. We're hoping to continue to have that good group. Parents, 
I need you to help me in, in ensuring that we're providing a safe and secure atmosphere by taking your child down the steps right out here to the left when we dismiss and signing them in and getting your, your checkout or your, your ticket and security badge and, and their name tag because we want to make sure we're doing all we can to protect the littles, especially the least of these. And I know that everybody wants to do that as well. So when it's time to dismiss for Children's Church, parents, you'll just follow the leaders to the left out there and down the steps. There's the check-in station down there for you already ready to go. Don't worry, I'll be checking one in myself and I'll be down there in case there's any mishaps which not that we ever have those, but um, anyway. So Children's Church, VBS, if you're a worker, get your shirt and name badge after service. And don't forget, we are having a benefit sale towards the end of August. We'll have all that information for you this next Sunday, pretty much every way except for smoke signals. So, all right, well, thank you. I think that's it for me. All right, are there any first-time visitors with us this morning? If you are, just slip up your hand and uh, uh, so we can get an usher to give you a visitor's card. Oh, are you a first-time visitor? Look at that sweet little face. Oh, but I see you, I know you. Okay, we'll get you one. All right, very good, love it. Love it when they do that. All right, well, we're glad you're here this morning to worship with us. And uh, if you've come to truly worship this morning, then I want you to sing as if you were uh, 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 alone in the shower, you know, just letting it go, all of those wonderful things. Uh, sing like nobody is standing behind you or in front of you or beside you. Uh, just let it be uh, uh, your voice under the Lord. That's what I'm going to do, so tough luck on the rest of you standing around me. All right, so Ron, lead us and. and Let's all stand and sing together. In your hymnals, number 153. Him and worship Him is not only in songs and in word and even in deed, but one of those other ways that we do on a weekly basis is we give our tithes and our offerings unto the Lord. 
I want you to be reminded that as you give, that is an act of worship. It is you saying, Lord, I trust you to provide for me, to give me the job that I need, the work that I need, the income that I need, to pay the bills, to, to meet the needs, but I am giving back to you out of that first and foremost, that first percentage back unto the Lord, and trusting that you will make the rest meet every need that I have. So as we offer that this morning, I want to encourage you as you're leaving today, there are offering plates at the doors. Uh, just inside here as you're leaving, you'll see the offering plates. Just drop your offering in there. And uh, as you are, let that be an act of worship. Let it be a time when you say, thank you, Lord, for the provisions that you have given unto me this week. I'm going to ask Justin, if you would, to stand and, and offer the prayer for our tithes and our offerings this week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for letting us come this morning, God, and just worship you, Father, Lord, and just look to you and revive ourselves, God, Lord, and just be a witness and a bold light for you, God, Lord. We just pray for the offering, Father, God, Lord, and people would just be given what you have blessed us with, God, Lord, and we would give you with the heart of forgiveness, Father, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for what you do, God, Lord. We just lift up our pastor and our message this morning. Let's pray, Lord, that he would just touch the hearts, God, Lord, that he would just do everything for you, God, Lord. Amen. Well, I'm excited that we got a choir again, that we've got folks that are there to sing, and they're going to sing a special for us this morning, so I'm excited about that. I believe most everybody knows this. If you know it, <coughs> I'm pretty sure you won't be able to stay in your seats, so just go ahead and get up and sing it with us. Stand up. <laughs> get up, get up. You know what that means? Stand up, yes. We need the lights on. Hopefully they go in Let's go. Chill.
Josh, do you want to search? Again, remind them what they got to do. I said remind them. All right. Because I need at least 15 or 20 reminders, I assume you do as well. It is time to dismiss for Children's Church. Parents, if you will, just follow your leaders down the steps there, or me, I'll be going that way as well, and we'll check them in and get our badges and come right back. All right, as the little ones are heading out to uh, find their way down to Children's Church, Anybody need a bulletin or an outline before we get started? There may be one or two left back there. All right. You have your Bibles with you this morning. I want you to turn to a, a familiar passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at uh, verses 13 through 16 this morning as we uh, uh, take a look at God's Word. Um, together, we're going to be... Uh, looking at what God gives us here about making a difference where you are. I hope that uh, that is a desire of your heart as uh, uh, you're living out the Christian life, that you're making a difference where you are. Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 5, we start reading in verses 13 through 16, so we're going to uh, have you stand one more time this morning as we uh, honor the reading of the Word. And so if you would, stand with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read together verses 13 through 16, and it should be there on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible with you this morning. But here's what God's Word says. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if, you, if the salt has lost its savor, where shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven." Lord, we ask that, Father, today as we break open the bread of life, as we read today this very short passage of Scripture, but very powerful words unto each and every one of us, that, Lord, that we would see clearly today what you are commanding us to be and what you're commanding us to do. And, Lord, so I pray that you would take the words that you have given to us in your own words, and that, Father, that you'd give me the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit to teach what you have said to us so that we might be able to make a difference where we are. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being called into a life that is to make a difference to the folks around us. So, Lord, I pray that you would take the Word, take the Spirit, and speak to us, and, Lord, draw us from where we are to where you want us to be today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to begin, I, I read a story this week, and, and it's rather lengthy, and I almost didn't use it but because of the length of it, but it's so wonderfully done that I wanted to share it with you. And here's how this story goes. A quiet forest dweller lived high up above in the Australian village along the eastern slopes of the Alps. The old gentleman had been hired many years ago by a young town council to clear away the debris from the pools of the water up in the mountain crevices that fed the lovely springs flowing through their town. With faithful silence, re uh, regularly he patrolled the hills, removed the leaves and the branches, and wiped away the silt that would otherwise choke and, and contaminate the flesh, fresh flow of water. By and by, the village became a popular attraction for vacationers. Swans floated along the crystal clean spring. Mill wheels of various businesses located along the water. Farmlands were naturally irrigated. And the view from restaurants was picturesque beyond description. Years had passed. One evening, the town council met for its semi-annual meeting. As they reviewed the budget, one man's eye caught the salary figure being paid the obscure keeper of the spring. Said the keeper of the purse, who is this old man? And why do we keep paying him year after year? No one ever sees him. For all we know, the strange, um, 
the strange ranger of the hills is doing us no good. He, he instantly uh, declared that he was no longer necessary. By unanimous vote, they all dispensed that the old man's services would no longer be needed. For several weeks, nothing seemed to change. By early autumn, the trees began to shed their leaves, small branches snapped off and fell into the pools, hindering the rush of flowing of sparkling water. One afternoon, someone noticed a slight yellowishing brown tint in the spring. A couple of days later, the water was much darker. Within another week, a slimy film covered sections of the water along the banks of the, uh, of a, and a foul odor was soon detected. The mill wheels moved slower. Some finally ground to a halt. Swans left, as did the tourist. Clammy fingers of disease and sickness reached deeply into the village. Quickly, the embarrassed council called a special meeting, realizing their gross error in judgment. They hired back the old keeper of the springs. Within a few weeks, the veritable river of life began to clear up. The wheels started to turn, and new life returned to the hamlet in the Alps once again. This story is really more than just an idle tale. It carries with it the vivid re relevance uh, of an analogy directly related to the times in which you and I are living today. We think about the world. When we think about the condition that it's in. We've got to ask the question, how did it get in this shape? And I think it points back to the very reality that we can't say it's the world's fault. I think it points very clearly back to the very reality that the church has not done what its job is supposed to be. When we think about it, we think about the fact that as it carries that relevance to us, what the keeper of the springs meant to that little switch village, Christians mean to the world today. We Christians may seem feeble, needless, unimportant, small according to the vastness of this world. But God, with God's help and, and, and the society that, that we live in, we are to make an, a, an attempt to make a difference. We are to be an influencer in the world. Jesus called his followers to be a frontline militia. Nowhere do we get the impression that Jesus ever wanted us to live in isolation, separated from the world. It is impossible to live, truly live, for the kingdom of God in private. We are called out to a social agenda and an outward expression of God's principles. We are called to make a difference by influencing and impacting the world around us. In other words, we're to make a difference where we are. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, a famous missionary or Methodist missionary, author, evangelist, was asked to name the number one problem of the church. He quickly replied that the number one problem was irrelevance. He went on to say that three quarters of the opposition of the church stems from the world's disappointment of the church. He, we promise to make men different, but promises go largely unfulfilled. In other words, when the world looks at the church and sees that the church doesn't look any different than the world around them, even though the church proclaims, come in to a relationship with Christ and Christ will change you and make your life different. But when the world looks at us and sees that we're living just like the world, they're mostly disappointed and we become irrelevant. 25 years have passed since Dr. Jones made that statement. And I believe today that statement is probably truer than it has ever been. The number one problem of the church today is irrelevant. Because the world looks at us and says, why do we need the church? If the church does not fulfill the promise that God has said that it would to bring people in, to give them the conversion of Christ, and then to make them into new people, into something different than the things of the world. Then church, we ought to just close our doors and stay home. But the church has been called to make a difference. 
And it begins by you and I who are sitting in the pews to start allowing our lives to be changed by the power of God so that we are different from the things of this world. It is up to us to recognize that we have been called to make a difference in our community. Put simply, the church has lost its influence in our community. There are many reasons why this is so, but one reason stands out above all the rest. The church has lost its influence because Christians have neglected their responsibility to be the salt and the light in the world. As we have neglected to be what God has called us to be, the world has decided to ignore us. But on the flip side of that, it is also true that when the church is being the salt and the light that it needs to be, the church is being all that God has called them to be, the world wakes up and takes notice of the church. My friends, we can look back at history and see that when the church was doing what the church was supposed to do, we were making a difference in the world. We were impacting our communities. We were impacting the laws that are coming out of Washington. But we, the church, have become silent. We have become darkened. We have become saltless. And the world around us has been influencing us instead of us influencing them. It is sad to say that more of the world is in the church than the church in the world. If that doesn't cause us to think, there's something wrong with our wood. All right. So... When we are the salt and the light, the world listens to us. When we aren't, they don't. Upon sending out his disciples, the Lord here in Matthew chapter 5 was giving us the Beatitudes. We don't have time to talk about those, but essentially they were the interior qualities that you and I as Christians are supposed to have. Jesus crowns those interior qualities that we are to have as Christians with an exterior change agent that says, this is what you should be doing. These two descriptive terms inform us of, uh, of the fact that we have been called to make a difference where we are. In our day, in our age, the age of big thinking and large images, why did Jesus commission us to be salt and light? You know, have you ever thought about it? Why didn't he say, you know, listen, I want to I wanna, I wanna get their attention. I want to speak to the pride of, of people. So, you know, maybe he would have appealed better if he had appealed to our pride and said, you're the lions of the world, or you're the eagles that soar over the world, or maybe you're the stars that shine in the night. Man, that would get my attention. Man, boy, I, I, I'm important. I'm special. The world needs me. But how many of us as Christians really feel the world doesn't need us? Well, let me remind you, the world needs you desperately, more than you ever imagined. When we serve Jesus as he has commanded, using the gifts and talents to meet the needs of people around us, we become the salt and the light that people need, pointing them to a God who can save them and will change them if they will allow him. So this sermon that I want to preach to you this, this morning is simply to make a difference. We need to make a difference in the communities in which we are living. Understanding why Jesus used these simple terms of salt and light reveals the substance of the influence that we're to have upon the world around us. So what I want to do is just dig deeper into what does it mean to be salt and light? What are the purposes of salt and light? I think the reason Jesus chose these two metaphors, salt and light, is because of the unique qualities that each of them have. Both carry enormous influence. Both are immediate impact. Both are noticeably instantly. Both are described in a way that is difficult to veil them, to hide them. Both are permeating. So let's take a closer look at salt first. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. You know, that, that phrase is so famous that it's become a proverb in our English language. If someone is genuine, useful, honest, straightforward, and without hypocrisy, we oftentimes say that that person is a salt of the earth type of person. We use that phrase to refer to someone's characteristics of being good. But what did Jesus mean? Salt was one of the most common substances 
in the ancient world. In Jesus' day, did you know that Roman soldiers were paid in salt and would revolt if they didn't get their rations? Indeed, our English word for salary comes from a Latin word, salarim, which simply means salt money. Our own expression, that man is not worth his salt, simply says that that guy is not worth his weight, is a reminder of the high value that salt had in the biblical days of Jesus. Why would he choose? Because he knew that this was something that people understood. They understood the value of it. They understood the importance of it. And they understood when he compared it to their Christian life, how that they could see it would make a difference in the world around them. But what did they use salt for? Well, I want to share with you several things. First of all, it was a preservative. Of course, we know in ancient world, the primary function of salt was simply a preservative. It retarded spoilage. Likewise, the believer's act is, is that of a, a preservation in the world. As we bring Christ's word in his kingdom's influence into our society, we help protect our society from the full sway of the evil that otherwise would, would penetrate and, and permeate our society. Imagine just for a moment, if you would, have you ever thought about what it's going to be like the Bible says in Revelation there's going to come a time and a day when the church is no longer here. Have you ever stopped to think about what that would look like? Think about what our society would be like today if there was no church influence in our society today. Think about how that would impact us as a community. Think about the fact that uh, what if there were no churches in the land? What if there were no Christian colleges what about no ch church-supported hospitals or no Christian social action groups such as Samaritan's Purse and others like that? What about the other Christian organizations ministering to those in need? What if all of those disappeared? What kind of world would we be living in? Man, we think about what the church is doing in the world today the impact that we are to, to hold back the, the, the fact that the elements of, uh, of evil want to destroy our society and our world. But if it weren't for the impact of the church, it would have a free reign and it would do just that. Thank God we are called to be the preservative in the world. But yet, in order to be the preservative of this world, we must first be salty. We must be willing to say, I am different than that of the world. Listen, secondly, it's also a flavoring. You see, salt brings out a flavor of food that seems to be hidden in them. I don't know about you, but I, there's, there's a lot of foods that I like to put salt on because it brings out such a flavor in them that you, you don't get without it. In similar fashion, Christians are supposed to bring spice and zest to life. And it brings out a side of us that has been hidden from the world. The Christian is to be the personification of a life that is well lived in Christ. We're to be that example. We're to set forth our, our lives in such a way that, that it causes people to say, man, that is worth tasting. Here's a strange one. Did you know that salt is, was used as an uh, antiseptic? I read this. In ancient times, newborn babies were rubbed down in salt so that the cuts and the infections of medically primitive birth methods could be healed. Ouch! While this sounds painful, the cleansing of the wounds with salt was very effective in fighting infections. I don't know about you, but I don't want to try that. Christians, however, have a responsibility of not only pointing out sin to others, which, by the way, according to the world, we're real good at pointing out everybody else's sins while living in our own. But here's what the Bible says, that it's not our job just to point out sin, but it's our job to be the salt that, that helps to heal. Listen, by exerting our influence... We prevent the effects of disease and death caused by sin. We ought to be promoting healing. 
We ought not to be promoting infection and disease of sin. The third one, it creates a thirst. You see, salt is a great tool to create a thirst. How many of you have heard the old saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? Well, the rest of that phrase goes on to say, but if you give him a salt tablet, he gets thirsty. Okay? All right? As Jesus made people thirsty for God the Father, so are you and I as Christians supposed to make people thirsty for the real life that is found only in Christianity. The problem is, if we're not living a salty life, the world looks at us and says, where is your life different than mine? I wonder how many of us would actually honestly say today that my life is truly different than that of the world that I live in. Church, it's time for us to be honest before God because as we sang that song about revival, oh, how the church desperately needs to be revived. We need to become that which we have been called to become so the world around us will be affected by our lives. Well, let's take a closer look at light. We've looked a little deeper into the salt, but let's look at light for a minute. Jesus not only says that you're the salt of the earth, he also says that we're the light of the world. Now the dictionary defines light as the source of illumination. But what does light truly illuminate? Well, I've got a few things that I want to share with you that it illuminates. First of all, light dispels the darkness. Thank God. The Bible says that the light of the world came into the world. He came to shine his light. But the sad part about that is the Bible goes on to say, but the, the world didn't want him. For they loved living in their darkness better than living in the light. You see, the light came and expelled the darkness, but the darkness ran to find other darkness. The problem with our world today is that we are not lighting the world enough so that the darkness is expelled anymore. Everywhere we look around us, we see darkness. It's because we're not letting our light so shine. The Bible says here that we are not to light our light and hide it under a bushel, but no, to put it on a candlestick so that it lights up the entire room. My friends, our lives are not just for our own personal life. They are to light the world around us. Light expels the darkness. Christians reflecting the light of Christ, bearing His light, dispel the spiritual darkness. This process oftentimes seems slow. But if we will continue to shine, we will see the results. Light also reveals that which is unseen. Have you ever walked into a dark room that you've never been in before, that you didn't know what was in there, only to have someone suddenly turn on the light switch and then all the contents of the room become clear. As Christ's presence in our our world, as Christ's presence in our life, when we take it into the world, we become the instruments that reveal the truth of the Word of God to a world that's living in darkness. We are to illuminate the life in which they're living. The third thing that we see is light awakens people. Boy, a light is supposed to awaken us. I don't know about you, but I'm so sick of the terms that they're using in our world today. We've got to be woke. It's time the church wakes up. It's time the church realized the light has come and the daylight is here and we need to be up and about and doing the work while it is yet day. The Bible says that we have been woken up either by the sun shining in our life uh, through the windows of our life or by someone coming into our room and turning on the light. We've all been woken up one of those two ways. I, you know, I don't know about you, but there's times when I like to sleep in. I don't do it often, but there's times when and then uh, our bedroom window, the light shines in and the, the, the sun it just says to me, guess what? It's time to get up. It's time to get going. It's time to get moving. 
When my kids were small, I used to hate it when they would come in the bedroom, even in the middle of the night or whatever, and they would want something, and what do they do? Flick on the light. You talk about wake you up in a hurry. You see, light is made to wake us up. It's caused to respond to the darkness. As Christians, we're to be the light in the world, awakening men and women to a truth of the kingdom's arrival. Jesus has come, and the church age is now. But listen, my friends, it's coming to an end soon. And we must awaken those around us. And then fourthly, light gives a warning. In the same sense that a lighthouse is placed, and you're going to see lighthouses around in different rooms this week as you go in, as the lighthouse is placed be beside the, 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 the ocean's edge to remind folks that there are rough waters and dangerous rocks, be aware. Just as a policeman has a light on his car so that he can turn it on as he's weaving in and out of traffic through town to get to somewhere important so that it lets us know that we need to get out of the way. The light of Jesus Christ has been given so that we might warn people that if you don't accept the light, when you die, you will go to hell and be forever extinguished from his love. We have to be that warning. But listen, we'll never reach the world if we're not salty or if we're not bright. If we've got to be the salt and we've got to be the light. So how then can we make a difference in a world that seems to be so dark and that seems to be so flavorless this, these days? We are called to be the salt, the seasoning, and the light bearers in the world. Some of us might be thinking, wait a second, surely God doesn't mean me. Yes, God meant you and me. His followers are to be the salt seasoners and the light bearers in this world. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he meant you and you alone. His words were not a suggestion, but a command. With urgency in his voice, Jesus says to us all, if you are salt, then season the world around you. If you are light, shine upon their darkness. Spell their darkness. But preacher, how do I do that? When I live in a world that is so broken, so dark. I'm glad you asked. I want to give you just a few things that you and I can do every day that can make a difference. First of all, we need to recognize that your uniqueness makes a difference. Now, uniqueness is something that is unique to each and every one of us. It's something that makes us different. <clears throat> the Bible says that before we became a Christian, we were like the world, just like everybody else. But when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we became different, unique. God began to create in us a uniqueness that the world does not have. You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Do you notice what's missing in that command? There are two words that we, would, we oftentimes as Christians put in there that are not in there. And that is we're like salt. Or we oftentimes say that um, we're as light. No, we're not to be like or as. We are to be salt, and we are to be light. We are to exactly be those things. We're not just to, to, to be an image of them, but we are to be those things. We're commanded to be and not be like, but to be salt and light. The common denominator of salt and light is the fact that they are unique in their distinctiveness. There's nothing quite like salt. There's nothing quite like light. Just as salt is different than pepper, light is different from darkness. So Christians are to be distinct from the world in which we live. 
The Bible tells us that we're not to be of the world, or we're to be in the world, but not of the world. The Bible reminds us, and I want to just share with you what Jesus prayed for us in John chapter 17. Listen to these words. Again, they're words of Jesus in John chapter 17 and verses 15 through 18. He said, I pray not that thou should be taken out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. Different, unique. That they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He's praying to the Father. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. It is the Christian's uniqueness to the world that should make a difference in the world around us. In business, we call that marketing. In advertising, they call that positioning. In basketball, they call that strategy. In Christian, we call that holiness. Something that we all need more of. It is a distinguishing feature above us all that we are set apart from the rest of the world. The word holiness simply means that we are set apart from that which is all around us. When we say God is holy, it means that He is high above the sinfulness of this world. We, as holiness in the image of Christ, we're to be different from the things of this world. Our lives should not be the same. We need to recognize that our uniqueness makes us different. But also, we need to walk close to Christ daily. My friends, you will never be the salt and light of this world if you only walk with Christ on Sunday mornings for 45 minutes. Won't happen. Now, I've got a story I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But Jesus warns his followers, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It then is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Perhaps the most important thing about salt is that its purest form, it never loses its taste. Salt is always to be salt. It is extremely stable compound. You can put salt in a dish and walk away and come back 10 years later and guess what? It's still going to be sodium chloride, salt. The only way that salt can lose its saltiness, and Jesus was exactly talking about this, is when we mix it or dilute it with things other than salt. The point Jesus is making that it is dangerously easy for Christians to become diluted and lose their saltiness and their salty preserving influence on the world. If you and I are uh, uh, not affecting our world around us, the world around us is affecting us. If we're not salting the world, the world is rotting us. In order to prevent the world from affecting us, we must stay in close contact with the ultimate influencer, Christ himself. Jesus reminds us this when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches, but he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. I read about a father who bought his daughter a gift. You know, one of those glow-in-the-dark figurines. He kept it in the box all day long until he got home late that night. When he gave it to his daughter, she tore open the box with great excitement to reveal the gift. But when she opened it, it did not glow. She said, Daddy, what's wrong with it? The answer was revealed on the label that was attached to the figurine. If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the daylight every day. So it is with us. If we want to shine in the darkness, that the world is all the way around us, we have to be in Christ every day. We must be in the vine so that, that He flows through us. We must be close to Him in order for Him to shine through us. Salt in a salt shaker 
light under a bushel basket, the Lord says, has no impact upon anyone. Christians void of visible deeds can't make a difference. So he says, make your works visible to those around you. A city hit on a hill cannot be hidden. Our influence, however small or great, will be seen. Salt can be tasted. Light can be seen. Jesus is calling us as Christians to be audio-visual Christians. We need to speak the truth and then we need to be living the truth. The Christian seasoning is something to be tasted. The Christian's life is something to be seen. Secret discipleship does not exist. Either our secrecy destroys the discipleship or our discipleship destroys the secrecy. Our Christianity should be vibrant and visible. Don't hide it away, but be salt that savors and flavors and influences. Be light that shines, not just for you and yours, but for the community in which you live, the world in which you're from. And let me just end by sharing with you how that we can understand the spear of our impact. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what was Jesus saying? He was letting us know that the impact that He intended to have when He came to this world was not just on the Jewish nation, not just on a few that would listen to Him, but upon the entire world. He came to have an impact on humanity. And then Jesus gave to us, before He left, the Great Commission. He said, I came to impact humanity, but I'm leaving you with instructions to carry on the task. Because in the gospel, we find that he tells us in the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is laying the foundation for a worldwide challenge. The church is never, never intended just to reach a few, but to be an influence upon them all, to be a light in the darkness to be salt to a world that needs savoring. The disciples are to be the salt in the earth and the light of the world. And our sphere of, uh, of Christian influence is to the whole world. We, today, are called to be salt to the earth. We are called to be light to the world. To reduce it to anything less would be equivalent to restricting its power, its authority, and the grace of our Lord. For He Himself has informed us that the whole world is our sphere in which we are to influence with activities and we are to live out our life in such a way that they see God in us. The entire world is supposed to feel the seasoning influence and see the light's impact that we as Christians offer. Now, I know you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, that's great, preacher, but I don't go to all the world. Great. And I've got a message for you. God did not call us to save the world. Nope. It's not your job, not my job. But he did call us to make a difference. To make a difference right where we are. And because as we know that we make a difference where we are, that person that we're making a difference to may be the one that's going to the world. 
thing is that we need to do what we're called to do. We, need to, we can't do everything, that's for sure. But we can do something. And what we can do, we ought to be doing. And what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be the salt and the light of the world. So i got one question for you to ask yourself. I'm not asking it. I'm just going to tell you to ask yourself. Am I being the salt? Am I salty at all? Am I shining a light at all? And how bright am I? How salty am I, really? What does God need to do in me today to make me more salty, to make me more bright, so that my influence can make a difference where I am? That's the challenge today. So as Tammy and Ron are coming to prepare for our invitation hymn, I want every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. I want to just ask you the question, how salty are you? How bright are you? Would it be good for you to be saltier? Would it be good for you to be brighter? Would it be good for the, the folks around you, your community, your, your family, your, your associates? Would it make a difference in their life if you were actually different than the world? Would it make a difference in their lives if you were shining Jesus brightly? It's something that each of us has to ask ourselves. It's not something that I can answer for you but it's something you must answer for yourself. So let me pray for you. Father, as I worked on this sermon this week and wondered even of myself, am I salty enough? Am I being bright enough for others to see you in me? Am I bold enough to go out and let others See my love for you. Lord, it challenged me as I knew we were getting ready for vacation Bible school. We're going to invite the community in. We need to be different. They need to see something in us that they don't see out there. Father, I pray for the church. I pray that we would be what you've called us to be, different from the world. God, would you convict our hearts of the sin that is is so easily besetting us, that we've gotten so comfortable with in our life that we don't even consider it sin anymore. Lord, would you let your light so shine on us that it would expose our darkness? Would you let your salt so pour on us that it would preserve us from being rotted by the world so that we can make a difference? Revive us again, O Lord, I pray. Restore and renew the church to make the commitment to say we offer a Savior who changes lives. Then be that, a changed life. In Jesus' name I pray.